My research uh, focuses on Tibet, especially working with Tibetan refugees in both the Himalayas and in North America. Um, but I also include the United States in that, in that the United States through the CIA has been part of the Tibetan struggle since the 1950s. And then more recently, I'm also looking at politics in the United States as well. The graduate course on history and memory is one of my favorite ones to teach. And that looks at the relationship between the two, right? What is um, Basically, what is the and that connects history and memory? Why do we put those two together? Okay, one of my ongoing research projects is on refugee citizenship. And this is um, has to do with Tibetan refugees who first came out in 1959 following the Chinese Communist invasion of Tibet and first went to India and Nepal. And in India and Nepal at those times, the Tibetans were not allowed to become citizens. So what I'm interested in is in the refusal of citizenship in India and Nepal, but then coming to North America, Tibetans are obtaining citizenship, but they are refusing to give up sovereignty. So they're maintaining their refugee identity in terms of a political claim to Tibet while becoming citizens of new countries. My research interests are uh, focused on Cuba, the Caribbean, um, issues of race, um, tourism. The graduate course I've taught most frequently is Anthropology of Race, um, and that course um, basically teaches how, where anthropology has uh, began with race. I believe we were the ones that constructed and created the categories of race, um, pulling it to contemporary time, the post-colonial period, and into the 21st century where African Americans are starting to, or have been part of the conversation, a uh, critical conversation on race. My research continues to be in Cuba. Tourism is, is exploding in the country, and I'm interested in how uh, Cubans who have long been excluded from success in uh, moving up the social ladder, particularly Cubans of African descent, um, are getting into this new realm. Um, otherwise, they're going to remain at the lowest levels. My primary research interests are um, how people live and work with data, and then how they understand different kinds of privacy laws and data protection laws. Um, so one course that I teach is called Science, Technology, and Society. And that course is an overview of how different anthropologists and other social scientists have done ethnographic research in laboratories and other places where scientists work. All of our behaviors and interactions are recorded, sometimes with our knowledge and consent, and other times not. This new European law is really pushing back against that and saying, no, there are privacy is a human right. A research project that I'm working on now is looking at how different groups of people in Sweden are trying to adapt to this new law and trying to make sure that they're able to continue doing the things that they want to do with data, even with this new law coming into effect. Well, as an environmental anthropologist, I'm mostly studied or mostly interested in studying mining development. I have been working in Papua New Guinea for over 20 years, looking at the impact of a large-scale gold mine on indigenous people there. And then lately I have a new project in southwest Colorado looking at how different communities are coming together to clean up abandoned mine land waste. And then my one graduate course I've been teaching sort of lately is Space, Place, and Capitalism. The class itself is structured around the argument that Henry Lefebvre made in his book, The Production of Space, in which new modes of production create new kinds of spaces. And so what we do is we look at some of the theoretical understandings of space and place and then use case studies from around the world to see how mostly indigenous peoples have been impacted by capitalism and how that creates changing ideas of land, relationships with each other, relationships with uh, other than human spirits, with trees and everything else in their environment. Currently in the United States West, there are over 500,000 abandoned mines and many of them leak acid mine drainage into the waterways. Frequently what happens then is communities will come together and find ways to try to clean up some of these abandoned mine lands. Um, and so what my project is looking at is how these watershed advisory groups emerge out of sort of local concerns about environmental pollution in the land, but then also how they're tempered by national laws. So my research interests focus on um, the ways in which family connections and disconnections or family-like relationships impact well-being, broadly construed. And I focus mostly on Japan, but I'm re working more recently in North America as well. So grad seminar that I developed here is um, called Embodiment and Mental Health. 
And I also teach a seminar on language and storytelling. My long-term research has been in Japan focused on people connected to the Japanese child welfare system. And that led me to be really interested in these questions about um, family relationships, interpersonal relationships, disconnection, and the stakes for people's long-term well-being. My research is on the uh, growth of the middle class and the growth of Islamic consumer culture in Indonesia. Those two things have happened simultaneously in the last two decades. And we are seeing more and more elaborate forms of women's uh, modest fashion that partly have to do with statements of religiosity and, and Islamic piety, but also our commentaries on popular discontent or worry about the distribution of wealth and corruption. I teach courses on feminist theory, I teach the introductory course on anthropological theory, and I teach courses on affect theory. I'm also interested in the ways that the proliferation of covered styles in Indonesian popular life and popular culture is in direct contradiction to what has been a kind of proliferation of an ostensible claim or desire for more transparency in political governance and by uh, student activists. And it's not surprising that women in particular are ambivalent about the claims for exposure as a sort of universal good solving all of the social ills. What I study is large-scale transformations in East African savannas both within an ecological and a social framework. I teach a graduate seminar in human ecology and a graduate seminar in methodology. My project is asking the research question, under what conditions do extreme events become transformative? And that is an in-depth study of the 2008-2009 drought in northern Tanzania. I do collaborative research with Native American communities and I connect Native American communities to collections in the museum. And one of the ways that I advise graduate students is in curation or curating Native American collections and teaching collections managers in the museum studies program. We have people that are doing collaborative archaeology and doing public anthropology. And so currently, for instance, I'm working with the Mandan Hidatsa Arikara Nation. Um, they are in North Dakota. And and we are working on a comic book together um, to tell the story of a historical repatriation and some of the repatriation work that we've done with them in more recent years. So at the core of my collaborative research practice is a commitment to reciprocity and relevance to the communities with whom we work. My research interests have morphed from uh, looking at race, class, gender, sexuality um, in Brazilian shanty towns to more recently working on nuclear energy issues and trying to look at the effects of high technology energy projects on diverse populations. I have taught a recent course on um, looking at the anthropology of the environment. And I teach it from a very humanities-based perspective. Right now, I'm actually focusing in on the Angra dos Reis nuclear zone in Brazil. And I'm looking at um, how statistics around cancer are formed, trying to nail down whether the uh, nuclear energy project has any effect at all on cancer rates there. Our program is small, which means you get a lot of individual attention. Uh, we also have a very diverse group of faculty in terms of where they work in the world and the topics on which they work. We are gender diverse, we are sexuality diverse, racially diverse, and I think students can find different places to fit in. Well, I think that we're, we're a very um, high-performing group of faculty, and so we publish a lot, um, we get a lot of grants, we get do a lot of grant review, and so we're able to offer, I think, students a really good perspective on what it takes to be successful in a program. Our students get incredible training here, and I think that they leave the program really professionalized and have a lot of opportunities for um, freedom in their research here. The department offers a lot of resources for students, so we have a graduate student speaker series, so students get to 
pick out a scholar whose work they're really interested in a few times a year and invite that person to campus to give a talk. And what I think is really unusual about our program is that masters and PhD students can get small pockets of money to do summer research. Our graduate program is very focused on research, on getting students into the field. And so someone who's self-motivated and who is excited about being in the field, about collecting, learning people's stories and then retelling them is someone who would be a good fit for our program.